So our first speaker today is going to be Paul Scott, and he has been a lifelong environmental advocate. He, in 2005, co-founded Plug in America, which is an organization that promotes the production of electric vehicles. Um, he also does some consulting for Solar City, and he has a 2002 Toyota RAV4 that is an electric car that he's been powering off of his solar panels at his house in Santa Monica. So, without further ado, I want to introduce you guys to Paul Scott. Thank Great, thanks. Um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I've got about 50 minutes, and uh, I know that you're going to have a lot of questions. So, if you have a question, I want you to ask it then and not save it to the end. Um, uh, let's see. Starting off, I was just reading the paper while I was waiting. Uh, Thomas Friedman in the New York Times read his column today, very important. And a friend of mine, Felix Kramer, is mentioned in there. And I want you to Google Felix Kramer and Cal Cars and find out what he's been up to. Um, but I was really excited when I was reading that and saw his name. So what I'm going to describe to you, all of you guys are you know, 18 to 20 something, and you're going to live a long time. The world is going to change a lot in your life. It changed a lot in my life, but it's nothing compared to what you're going to see. And uh, unfortunately, not all of it's going to be good. But you have some control over that as individuals and as a society. And as a society, I hope as individuals you will take part in that society and help move it in a better direction than what we've seen over the last few decades. Um, the future I want to describe to you, I'm just going to talk about transportation, essentially cars. Right now, virtually all of them are powered by internal combustion, gas, diesel, petroleum products. And the effluent coming out of those pipes, uh, well, you see it every day. You live in Los Angeles. What, what can I tell you? Uh, it only gets worse. In the future, probably 20 to 30 years from now, a lot of that's going to be gone. Most of the cars 20 to 30 years from now will be running on electricity. Whether it's in batteries or ultra capacitors, it will be electricity. Now, that electricity needs to be generated from clean, renewable sources. Uh, but that's part of your job as well, is to make sure that happens. Close down the coal plants as quickly as possible. Um, but let's go back to your future. You know, when you guys are my age, you will be driving an electric car. You will have driven an electric car for decades at that point. Um, but how are we going to get there? And what will that future look like? Well, imagine the 405, the 10, the 101. Pick your freeway. We're all uh, encountering them every day here. They're crowded with cars. Right now, you know, it's 3 o'clock, so the 10 is building up, the 405 is building up. And, and by the time I'm done, it's going to be packed. And all those cars right now are spewing effluent out their tailpipes. And um, we know what is in that effluent, and we know what it does to us. Um, but one by one, starting next year, actually starting this year with Tesla Motors, but cranking up very fast next year, with the Nissan Leaf, the um, Aptera, the, uh, the Volt from GM, and many other cars. One by one, those cars with tailpipes will go away, replaced by cars that don't have tailpipes. And you will be leading the charge, I hope, in getting those. So as you do that, over the decades, over the years and the decades, when fewer and fewer internal combustion cars are out there, your neighborhoods are going to get quieter. That's one of the things you'll notice. It's going to be real gradual. I mean, it's, when it's over, you, know, you just will realize, wow, you know, the cars used to make a lot of noise, and we don't have that anymore. You can't hear the freeway anymore. Um, when you're sitting at a, a coffee shop and you're sitting at an outside table and the street's there with all the cars going by, they're very quiet. They're making about the same amount of noise as a, a bicycle, and there's nothing polluting your air. So your air is fresh and clean. And it's quiet. Still have the traffic. You know, they're expecting 9 billion people by 2050. Most all of you will be alive then. It, there were two, a little over 2 billion people around when I was born. And we're at 6.7 billion now. So that's a big problem, but I'm not talking about population today. Bring me back another time, I'll talk about that. So in the future, all these cars and motorcycles and things are, are quiet and clean. And they're not dripping oil on the roadways. You know that as you go down the freeway, 
the middle of the road, right under the middle of your car, is darker than the rest. And do you know why that is? That's oil dropping from billions of crankcases and, and drops of oil that sit on the road until the next rain, and then it washes into the creeks, into the rivers, into the ocean, polluting everything along the way. But in your future, all the cars are clean. So I, I want you to just kind of like absorb that because you need to work toward that. It's not going to happen without your help. And your help is starting next year when Nissan's Leaf comes out or the Chevy Volt comes out or BYD's car comes out or all these others, um, when you're ready to buy your next new car, make sure it's got a plug on it. And if there's no plug, no deal. That's, that's what you tell the, the car dealers from now on. No plug, no deal. I only want a car that runs on electricity. Why? Well, electricity, for one thing, is domestic. We, we don't import electricity from overseas. We get a little from Mexico, a little from Canada, but primarily it's all domestic. So all of your money, when you buy energy to move your car, all of your money stays domestic. This is really important. We sent $700 billion in 2006 out of the country to buy foreign oil. Now, a lot of that money went to our neighbor to the north, Canada. We buy most of our foreign oil from Canada. We buy a lot from Mexico. So it stayed kind of local, but it's not in our country building schools and, and uh, putting up windmills and solar panels in our, in our country. It's outside the country. A lot of that, that money went to other countries that aren't so friendly to us, Venezuela. <coughs> Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of the worst countries on the planet. And I apologize if anybody is from Saudi Arabia here, but your government is worse than even George Bush was to ours. Um, and we don't want to give these guys our money anymore because Saudi Arabia gives a lot of their money to the madrasas. A lot of that money ends up buying the bombs and the bullets that are killing our soldiers. And we know that every time you buy gasoline, some of your money ends up buying the bombs and the bullets that kill our soldiers. Now, you don't want to do that, but you don't have a choice. Not yet, but you will. So the economic and national security issues around burning gas in cars to drive ourselves are serious. And you know, you've, got to, you've got to absorb that. You've got to understand that every time you turn your engine on, you're contributing to the need to buy more foreign oil. And the, and the unfortunate happenstance of giving some of your money to our enemies. Now, the other side of it, there, there are three big issues. I, I touched on the macroeconomics of it, and I touched on the national security. And we'll probably go back and forth around those a little bit more. But the big issue is the environment. Global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it, it's real. Now, a lot of you are, I mean, you're all students at a major university, so I assume that you, you understand that science is real and that speculation is not necessarily so real. Um, so there are people who might question whether or not climate change is real, but, you know, they are wrong. Climate change is happening, and um, it's going to seriously affect the, the globe, you know, as, as far as humans are concerned anyway, and, and a lot of the animals, flora and fauna, um, over the next decades, and you guys are going to have to deal with that. Um, so we've got to slow it down. It, it's way too late. <laughs> the horse is way out the door of uh, that barn, and we can't stop it. We can only mitigate the effects downstream. Um, the, the changes that are taking place right now are, are going to be pretty serious you know, in terms of desertification of a lot of our country and other countries, mass migrations of people, millions, tens of millions of people moving away from the shorelines, particularly in, in certain areas like Bangladesh and places like that. And these are uh, dirt poor people to begin with, you know, so they're being uprooted and moved because um, their, their land is no longer livable. And so we're going to have to deal with that from a national security standpoint um, as well as a you know, human rights standpoint. We've got to protect these people and, and hopefully keep them alive. So these, these are issues that we we're having to deal with um, starting now and only getting worse. So let's try very hard to, you know, as a person, as an individual, not contribute to that. So as you're driving your car today, you know, all of you, I assume, drive, are, are any of you driving electric vehicles now? Okay, 
So all of you are using internal combustion, whether it's a bus or whatever. Some of you ride bicycles, so that's good, but eventually you'll probably be driving a car. So as you do so, make sure that you drive using um, techniques that you know, maintain efficiency. Uh, they call it you know, ultra-myeline, or, or there's another term I'm spacing out right now. Anybody? Hypermyeline, thank you. Uh, Hypermyeline. So when you're driving your car, you, know, you can accelerate all the way up to a red light or a stop sign and then brake really hard, but you've just thrown away a whole lot of energy and polluted the environment a lot for nothing. So when you see a red light, a stop sign, um, coast, you'll still get there and the light will probably still be red or there are cars parked in front of you. So why throw that energy away? Why throw that money away? Why pollute the environment more than you need to? When you're driving on the freeway, we all do that. Allow a lot of room between you and the next guy. Yes, somebody's going to take it, but not always. I've been practicing this for quite some time now, and I've realized that in heavy traffic, I have five links in front of me, and everybody else is bumper to bumper. And sometimes they take it, but a lot of times they leave it there because they like having that space there too. So when the guy in front of me breaks, I don't break. I coast. And I get all the way up as close as I want to. Everybody has their you know, distance. And by the time I get there, usually they've moved before I got there and I didn't have to hit my brakes. So I was very efficient. I used very little energy in doing that. I once drove, as an example of how good it can work out, from Long Beach to Santa Monica on the 405 during rush hour, 28 miles. I hit my brakes once. It was scary. I had to pay attention. But, um, <laughs> but it was really cool. I mean, I because I, I, I'm always driving for efficiency in my car. And I thought, wow, that was really good. I used incredibly low amount of energy to get from point A to point B. Now, it was all electricity that I generated from sunlight, but you know, still, I don't want to waste it. Yes? If people get annoyed with you, though, because I try to coast and people just don't want to do it. Who gets annoyed with you? The person behind you? Yeah. Are there other lanes? <laughs> is, that person, <clears throat> is that person going to follow you to the gas station and buy your gas? <laughs> Screw him. <laughs> He is, he is not going to buy your gas. Um, you're in charge. And, and yeah, I get guys come up on my butt, and I slow down some more. <laughs> because, you know, I, I want to save them gas, too. So if they're going slower, then, yeah. Now, I don't get in the carpool lane, even though I, I can get in the carpool lane because I have that HOV sticker, that great white one, because it's an electric car. Um, but I don't get over there unless I'm planning on going at least 70. Now, a lot of people like to go 80, but you know, I'll go 70, and I'll block traffic behind me at 70, but that's tough. Uh, but, but I rarely have to do that because um, you know, I, just, uh, I just don't like driving that fast. But sometimes you know, you're in a hurry. So. But that's a good question. Yeah, never. You know, just relish the fact that you're slowing them down, too. That's how, that's how I look at it. Uh, they will not hit you. They will not hit you. They will go around you. Um, so, so these cars that are coming, you know, first of all, um, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about the hit. Oh, yes. Uh, how efficient regenerative braking is. It varies depending on how they've uh, uh, you know, uh, engineered it. Tesla uh, Motors has a really good regenerative braking, as does the uh, electric Mini from BMW. Um, and all that came from a company in San Dimas called AC Propulsion. Now, AC propulsion is the gold standard for electric vehicles in the world. They developed the motor and controller and the battery system that's in the Tesla. Tesla took it and you know, boosted it up a little bit, but that's essentially the AC propulsion motor and controller. And they've got, on, on their cars, um, and they convert uh, Scion XBs into these radically fast electric vehicles. Uh, but as you're driving, you're accelerating, and then as soon as you let off about halfway up, it starts regen. And, and if you have it dialed up to 100%, the regen will stop the car, and you really don't have to use the brake at all. It's such good regen. You, know, you have to learn to drive it. It takes a, a few days of getting out there and experiencing it, because as soon as you let off the gas, it's like, whoa, that's, that's stopping really hard. So you learn to feather it a little bit. And there's a point at which you're in neutral and you can coast. Um, but the regen, you know, anywhere from, I'd say, 20% to 60%. Um, and a lot of it, because you're putting the, the regenerative braking, puts electricity, generates electricity. Essentially what's happened is the motor then turns into a generator instantly, and that's what slows the car down. So, and it's generating electricity. It's taking the kinetic energy. I love talking to 
students at a university because they understand what kinetic energy is. So the, the moving car is kinetic energy, and so you're taking that kinetic energy, stopping it, but you're creating electricity, storing it back in the battery. But since batteries, um, for the most part, can't take uh, all the energy that you throw at them, um, and there are very, you know, various batteries that can take more or less, um, then some of the energy might be lost. But this is where ultracapacitors come in. Um, you guys all know what capacitors are, and ultracapacitors are just really big capacitors. And they are building those now and combining them with batteries. So let's, let's take a battery electric car. Uh, the battery pack that was in, in the car was optimized for both power and energy. You know, you, you want to do both if you can. Most batteries are really good at power or energy, but it, the ideal battery has uh, a lot of power and a lot of energy capacity. So, um, so it, but when you take off, you're using a lot of power, and maybe the battery isn't so good on power. So an ultracapacitor put in the car um, can then, all the energy stored in the ultracapacitor will release instantly. And so you can use all of that energy to take off from a line and then just bleed in the, the energy from the battery as you get up to speed. So then you can optimize the battery for energy and get a long distance, a long range. If you have, uh, and, and then when you go to break, since capacitors can take energy in as fast as you can throw it at them, it'll take 100% of the regen break. And so that's, you know, that's how you charge the capacitor back up. So the next time you stop, you'll use that energy again. And it's really an efficient combination. You're really going to start seeing those uh, probably five to ten years out. Apparently, and I'm not an engineer, but the engineers tell me it's, it's no small feat to uh, combine the uh, uh, ultracapacitor with the batteries. But they're definitely testing them, working on it. Uh, some of the major labs in the country and some of the major OEM, uh, OEMs. If I say OEM, it's Original Equipment Manufacturer. It's a car company, Toyota, GM, Ford. Um, so... These ultracapacitors ultimately will uh, enable us to have much longer range vehicles because you can then optimize the battery for energy and get a lot of kilowatt hours in it, kilowatt hours being the energy, and um, instead of having to use a lot of power from the battery, you'll just bleed the battery in as you get up to speed, and then you can go a long way. Um, just to give you an example of a, uh, an electric car from a major OEM, the car I bought seven years ago was a Toyota RAV4, EV. They made 1,500 of them, and uh, they destroyed about 600 of them before we stopped them. Uh, they were literally crushing these cars, and they were some of them had 3,000 miles on it. They were brand new cars, and they Can you were. Why they did that again? Yeah. Uh, how many have seen Who Killed the Electric Car? Okay, so you guys know the story. For those who didn't, in 1990, the um, California uh, Air Resources Board (CARB) up in Sacramento. It's uh, one of the most powerful regulatory agencies in the nation and they deal with matters of air quality. They passed a law in 1990 that stated that the car makers had to build 1% of their cars by 1998 as zero emission, which essentially were battery electric cars. That was the only technology available. So they told their engineers, you know, to get busy, build us these electric cars. California mandated it. They told their um, lobbyists, go to Sacramento and get rid of that damn law. Both teams went to work. Both teams succeeded. The engineers built these great electric cars, the GM's EV1, the Toyota RAV4, Ford Ranger pickup. All these cars were on the road by 98, 99. And by 2003, the lobbyists had uh, done their their deal and essentially overturned the law. And at that moment, it was right after I bought my car, um, the car makers started taking the cars back. Now, they hadn't sold them. They leased them. And these were special leases. These were closed-in leases. So um, typically, if you lease a car, you can, at the end of your three-year lease, you have a choice of buying it, continuing to lease, or, or turning it back in. Well, n not with these. You had to turn it back in. Now, Toyota was the only company that sold the RAV4. And they actually sold 338, 338 of them. And that's all they made available for sale. They, they will tell you. Um, when you talk to their people that, oh, we were only able to sell 300 of those cars. Well, that was 100% of what you made available, and you had a line of 5,000 people who wanted more. Why didn't you mention that? See, they don't want you to know that part of it because they're controlling the message. A lot of it is message, as you know. I mean, you guys are smart. Um, you know, you're lied to all the time. That's why you have to be very careful about what you read and what media sources that you use because there's so much lying out there. 
But, um, so Toyota lied about it, GM lied about it, but they all took the cars back and destroyed them. So we had just gotten our car. We had the, a three kilowatt solar system on our house in Santa Monica. So we're running our house and our car on sunlight. It's like, wow, this works so well. You know, the car's silent. It's more powerful than the gas version. It's, uh, there's no vibration or anything. It just goes. And we thought, everybody's going to want to do this. And a week after we got the car, they started taking them back. They shut down the program so you couldn't get one anymore. And there were thousands of people in line to get them. And they just, they just shut it down. And, um, and so they started taking these cars back. And we started you know, talking to other EV people, like, what's going on? And turns out they were taking the cars back and destroying them. And so we thought, well, the you know, media might want to know about this. This is kind of a good story. So we called 60 Minutes Frontline, and you know, we had some savvy media people in our organization. And so we were pitching this story. Nobody was taking it. Nobody wanted to run with it. And we thought, what the hell's going on? Well, you know, if you look at television and, and you look at the ads, you know, they are a lot of car, there are a lot of car ads up there. So the automobile industry was spending tens of millions of dollars on advertising and, and television. And so the media, and in newspapers, and so the media, you know, for whatever reasons, didn't want to cover this story, even though, I mean, if you thought there were thousands of fully electric cars that were completely viable and that the auto industry was taking it back and destroying them, you would think that was a story the media would cover. And they didn't. So we started organizing protests, and um, this guy, Chris Payne, we didn't know him from Adam, but he showed up with a video camera. He said, they took my car away and crushed it, and I'm going to make a documentary. Well, he kept showing up, and whenever we would have a protest, we'd call Chris, and he'd come out. And eventually, he had a sound guy, and then he had a camera guy. And, and so he cut together what he, what he had after he spent his $50,000 and took it into um, a guy named Dean Devlin, who's a producer of big popcorn films like Independence Day and The Patriot and things like that. And he, Dean had had an EV-1, and his father, uh, Don Devlin, had had an EV-1, and they were all pissed about losing their cars. So uh, Dean gave him a bunch of money, he became the executive producer, and said, go to Detroit, go to D.C., you know, get some more and make this better. What you've got's a good start. So uh, Chris went and shot a bunch more for another year and a half and covered the big... Um, thing that we did in, in uh, Burbank with EVs, uh, with General Motors EV1, and ultimately cut this thing together, showed it uh, to the people at Sundance. Sundance accepted it. Sony bought the rights, and so now he had a distributor and, and a Sundance premiere. And we went to Sundance to see it, because I'd never been to Sundance. I'd been in the film industry for 20 years, but I'd never been there. And so here I am going to this, um, this uh, premiere of this film, not knowing what we had. And, of course, we were still in the thick of the fight at that time. And so we saw the film, and I swear we rushed out of there. We were just, like, crying. We were so happy because you're, when you're trying to tell this story, um, there's so much to it, and people don't believe half of what you're saying. But to have that 90-minute thing up there that, sh that told the story so clearly, and everything in there was triple-checked triple for factual uh, accuracy, so it's all real. Um, and so after that, everything started changing. So the car companies started paying attention to us. We were still kind of um, uh, a group of activists, but we were starting to get a lot smarter. Some more people came and joined our organization, and these are people who were savvy at, at politicking and <clears throat> getting the message out. And so we became um, more of an advocacy group. We, we've got a 501c3 status. And so now we deal with the uh, regulators and the legislators and the car companies and the battery companies and the infrastructure people. And they're all seeking out our advice now. We have a seat at the table. Everywhere we go, uh, they want us to be there and participate. And the car companies, uh, especially Nissan and Coda and some of the others, I mean, they, they actively are courting our opinion on how to market these cars because we've been driving them for a long time. We know you, know, you have a limited range. So that's the only drawback, really, that and the cost of the batteries, but that's going to come down. Um, and so you've, you've got this really different driving experience. So how, how do you convince people that it's okay to have a car with a 100-mile range? And, and so we're able to tell them how to do that. And uh, have you, how many of you have heard of the Nissan Leaf? A, hand, a few of you. Okay, uh, the, it was just in L.A. for the first time uh, last Friday, Friday and Saturday. And um, it's this five-passenger sedan. 
Um, it looks really nice. I mean, if you like the look of the Prius or, or some of the other cars, I mean, you'll probably like this. And uh, it's got a 100-mile um, range. It's all electric. Uh, it goes 90 miles an hour. It's quite fast off the line. It has really strong acceleration. And it's quiet as a mouse. And it runs on sunlight. So that car will be available for sale next year, just under a year from now. I think October is when they're coming out. Um, yes? Do you know how much it's selling? They're, they haven't locked the price down yet, but here's, here's the cool thing. It's going to sell for about the same as an equivalent gas car. They say somewhere between 25 and 33. They haven't nailed it down yet. A lot of it's because the price of the battery is still fluctuating. You know, they're hoping to get the batteries a little bit cheaper. And what they're going to do is they're going to sell the car for about the same cost as an equivalent gas car, but they're going to lease the battery to you. Now, at first, I didn't like that because the whole lease thing, you know, it's just like, eh, they're going to take those back, they're going to do this. Um, but they explained it to me over the weekend, and now I, I favor it. Here's why. Um, the batteries that they're using now, all the new electric cars that are coming out will be using lithium-ion batteries. And just like in your cell phones and laptops, and as for use in cars, they work really well. They're very lightweight, they're very energy dense, and the price is dropping quite fast. Um, but we don't know how long they're going to last. Now, in your laptop, maybe you, you get two years out of them. Cell phone, maybe a couple of years. And you're thinking, mm, I don't want a two-year battery in my car. Well, you're going to get a good seven years, maybe more. They're shooting for 10. In the plug-in hybrids, they definitely have to go 10 because they have to warranty them for 10. And I'll get into that later. But for a pure battery electric, there's no warranty obligation from the state. So they will set whatever the market they think will bear. And so they're guessing that these batteries will last around seven years. And they, they should be correct on that. But since they don't know for sure, initially they want to lease the battery. So, so now you've paid the same as a gas car, but now you've got to lease this battery. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, when you stop to think about it, let's say you bought a Prius and you got it for 25. Well, now you've got to buy gas for it. And every month you buy a certain amount of gas. And it's going to vary a little bit, but it's probably going to be X amount per month. So they're going to lease the battery for about what you would pay for gas, you know, combined with the kilowatt hours that you have to put in. The kilowatt hours that you put in it are going to be really cheap. It's like buying gas at about 80 cents a gallon. So the cost of the electricity and the lease of the battery will be about what you would have paid to put gas in a Prius. So you're e even. But now you're driving a car that doesn't pollute, that doesn't enable you or, or mandate that you have to buy gas from foreign countries and give money to the bad guys. So you've got this great car for pretty much the same price as a gas car. So that's their goal. Now, eventually, as they get more um, time into the battery and they realize, well, these batteries are going to last X amount of time and they cost this much, then they'll sell the batteries. They may start selling the batteries right off the bat, too. But quite frankly, you know, buying them the first year, I, I would probably uh, lease the battery just because you know, you're same out of pocket. So you're not paying any more than a gas car. And you have an electric car. Yes? Uh, safety of the, no, um, they're not too light. As a matter of fact, uh, the goal is to get them lighter because of the weight of the battery. My, my car, the battery pack is 900 pounds in my car. And the whole car weighs 3,400. Now, you don't have a gas tank or a radiator or any of that. The motor is about like this. So it's you know, much lighter and smaller than a, a, an internal combustion engine. Um, but the battery pack is 900 pounds in my car. It's a nickel metal hydride pack holds 27 kilowatt hours. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very safe because you can take a corner really fast in that thing because all the batteries are down below. So you, you, your center of gravity is really low. Safety isn't, isn't an issue. Um, a lot of people have talked about the battery and whether or not they can take an impact. And, and all the batteries that are being used, they're all crash tested. Um, they're taking some of these battery cells and they're shooting them with guns and everything. And they're not igniting. I mean, they're, they're pretty good. There, there are types of lithium ion batteries that will ignite that have thermal issues, but uh, the ones they're putting in the cars do not. So it, it, they should be very safe, and especially when you compare it to a gasoline car that has, you know, a, gas, a typical gasoline tank is, has the explosive value of about 14 sticks of dynamite. So uh, 
you won't have that. <laughs> yes? Great question, and, and man, do I love that question. So I used to, a year ago, what I used to say is, well, um, the batteries are very expensive, and they have an intrinsic value because they want to recycle and get the lithium out or the nickel if it's a, a nickel metal hydride battery. And so at the end of the use, so, so the, the batteries at the end of use, they will run out of the ability to have enough power for your car. So it'll, it'll be a gradual thing, too. It won't just fall off. It just gradually gets less and less powerful. Um, so at that point, they still will hold quite a bit of energy. So you could take them and recycle them and, and sell them to a recycler and, and literally get hundreds of dollars for it. So they won't, none of them will end up in the, in the dump. By the way, all the lead-acid batteries in the world, uh, all the cars in the world have lead-acid batteries, about 30-pound battery. And in the United States, those are recycled at a rate of 98%. So hardly any of those end up in the dump because they have a, an intrinsic value of about five bucks for the lead. So you take it into Sears, you get your new battery, they give you five dollars for the old one, they palletize those, send them to a recycler. That's the lead acid. A nickel metal hydride pack at 900 pounds, that's gotta be worth a thousand dollars just for the scrap. So uh, it's illegal to throw them away, they have a high intrinsic value, they will not end up in the dump. But the really cool news, and I just learned this uh, a few months ago, the utilities. Now, Boy, I have to digress a little bit here. The utilities, you know, the, during the day, the demand for energy goes way up. At night, it goes back down. So it's a sine wave every day. And so they have to have enough capacity to generate uh, that the peak electricity plus 10%. So uh, by law, they have to have a lot of generating capacity for the daytime peak. Now at night, you know, it's way down there, really low. So they, they and, and by the way, they're also under... Uh, mandates to increase the amount of renewable energy in the grid mix the utilities are. So they're putting a lot of windmills up. Well, wind tent typically blows mostly at night. So you've got a lot of this energy coming on, on the grid at night and there's virtually no market for it. They've got all the base load from the coal plants and the nuke plants that are on 24-7. That's base load. And so at night there's hardly any demand for electricity. So what the utilities want to do, they want to use that green windmill power so they're going to gang up all these car batteries and they're going to buy them from Toyota or whoever. If you, go, if you take your Nissan Leaf in seven years from now, get a new lithium pack put in it, they'll take the old pack and they will sell it to the utility. And the utilities will gang them up in these big warehouses, charge them at night on the wind energy, the low cost clean wind energy, and then during the day when they would typically turn on a natural gas plant, they call them peaker plants, and they generate power just to meet the, the peak demand. And so, um, and they're on for typically two to three hours a day, these peaker plants. And that's why the energy during the, the peak times is very expensive because they have to capitalize, you know, spend millions of dollars building this plant and then maintain it because you're turning it on and off every day. So high maintenance costs. So the kilowatt hours that it generates just for those peak hours are very, very expensive. So since the uh, utilities can charge a lot for daytime power, they're going to have these warehouses full of batteries that will have all these kilowatt hours from windmills the night before that were really cheap and clean, and they'll just suck the kilowatt hours, put them onto the grid instead of turning on that natural gas plant. Yes? I like that idea, but isn't the reason that you're getting new batteries for your car that they don't fill the cars anymore? No, uh, no they, they don't have enough power. It still holds a lot of kilowatt hours, though. It won't hold as many as brand new, but they, they will still have quite a capacity. Now, eventually, even that will fade out, and they will ultimately be recycled. And I, see, I didn't know this until I started talking to the utilities, and, and they were just salivating at it because they, have, they really need that wind energy, but there's no market for it at night. I mean, literally, in, in West Texas, they put up so many windmills. There was a point uh, a while back where they literally had to give the energy away because there was nobody to take it. And... And so this, this is a real conundrum for the utilities. Yes? Could you just clarify for everybody the difference between power and energy? Because those terms get interchangeable. Yeah, power is, is like the, uh, the effort that it takes to push your car forward. Uh, it's the ability to do work, I think, was what I learned in fourth grade. <laughs> Kept that one for a long time. And energy is, is, is the, boy, well, it's kilowatt hours. Um, so if you have... 10 kilowatt hours and you can go four miles per kilowatt hour, you can go 40 miles. 
on 10 kilowatt hours. So I, I honestly, uh, it's the amount of energy available to do the work. Possibly, uh, some of you are physicists. You could probably do better than that. I hope. Yes. Over time, what he said. I'm going to remember that. Thank you. I'm just a guy. I'm not a scientist or an engineer. I just happen to fall into this, and I've learned a lot. But the, there are certain things where my uh, I'm lacking. But thank you. Now I have that one covered. Um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we commissioned a white paper on that. Um, a guy back in Ohio, PhD candidate, wanted to write it up, and he did the research. And he and, and several other people have also done papers on this. And apparently, there's quite a bit of lithium out there. Uh, Bolivia and Chile have the lion's share. China's got quite a bit. The U.S. has some too, um, but it's not as economical to extract it. <clears throat> you find lithium in lake beds, like Great Salt Lake, and out there. Uh, so apparently, that's that's where most of it is. Uh, there is enough for you know a couple of hundred million cars, um, and then the seawater has some in it too. But it is you know far away from being um, economic to get it out of seawater. It's just too dilute. But there's a lot of lithium in the uh, Earth's crust. Whether the price of lithium goes up enough, it's just like oil. You know, there's a lot of oil out there, but now we've, we've sucked up all the easy stuff, and now we're having to go deeper and deeper and deeper to get it. Um, so it, it, the price has to go up enough in order to justify going down deeper and getting it. Same thing with lithium. Eventually, if the price goes up enough, we'll be able to get, there's more than enough. Uh, I suspect that the ultracapacitor will, will step up and take that over. There's a company in um, Austin, Texas called eStore, and they claim to have an a ultracapacitor that can hold a lot of energy. Now, typically, capacitors, the problem with them for electric cars is they don't hold a lot of energy. They have really good characteristics. You can charge them and discharge them a million times. They don't wear out. They're very lightweight, and they're somewhat low cost. But if you uh, wanted to go a long distance, they just don't contain a lot of energy. eStore claims to have one that does. It's a ceramic type, and, and this is like the entire EV world is just salivating that this is real. Could be a, it could be not real, but they've gotten money from some, of, um, some very important people that put money into it. And I did hear from a pretty reliable source that there's a military vehicle with four hub motors in a 300-mile range, and it's running on e-store equipment. If e-store is real, um, it changes everything because it, it'll make batteries obsolete. I mean, you literally could make semis electric and have them go three or 400 miles, stop, charge them up, and go three or 400 miles. You can charge them as fast as you can put energy in. So you'll have these uh, you know, 250 kilowatt chargers. I charge my car on a 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger, and I can get about 18 miles of range for every hour of charging. So it takes about five and a half hours to charge my car. Um, and you do it at night, so it's not an issue. But you know, if a semi was going down the road, you wouldn't want to charge it on six kilowatts because it would take forever to charge it. So you put this big 250 kilowatt pipe up to it. I mean, we're talking some serious copper there. Um, but, you know, you can do that. It's physically possible to do it. So we're, we're hoping that e-store is real, and, and we'll find out. But I think down the road, they will find energy storage besides batteries, and it'll probably be capacitors. This is where, if any physicists are in the room, it's a really rich area to get into right now. Yes? All of the above. Uh, the U.S. grid is approximately 50% coal. Uh, several studies, some 40 studies, which can be found on our website, pluginamerica.org. Um, and these studies have looked very carefully at the well-to-wheels pollution generated uh, from a gas car 
and an electric car. So if you charge your electric car off the national grid, which nobody does because, you know, we're all in local grids, then you're some two to three times cleaner than a Prius. The only places where you're about equal on CO2 is in states that have 90 to 95 percent coal. Indiana, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, places like that are really high in coal. So at that point, you're even on the environment, um, but you're still, all your money stays domestic, and you're not giving any money to the bad guys. So even worst case scenario, it's still better to drive the electric car. And that is not a case against electric cars. It's a case to shut down the coal plants. There's a lot of damage that's done by burning coal. There are, right now, the grid um, gets energy from seven different um, areas. Coal, natural gas, nukes, wind, solar, geothermal, and hydro. So every utility in the nation, there's 5,000 of them, they have a grid mix. And some states, they're very heavy coal back east, and, and we definitely have to shut down the coal plants. Uh, but here in California, it's, it's like, I think we're 12% coal. So in California, if you charge an electric car in the California grid, you're like five times cleaner than a Prius even if you just get your electricity from your utility. Now, if you're DWP, anybody DWP in here? Yeah, 44% coal. It's the dirtiest utility in the state of California. They're trying to change that. Uh, they've been a horrible utility for decades, but there's some really good people. Dave, David Freeman is in charge right now, and he's definitely trying to clean that up. So your rates are going to go up because you've enjoyed getting cheap electricity from coal plants. And by the way, all the coal plants that supply energy f to DWP, none of them are in California. They're all in other states. So, and they, have, you know, they wholesale kilowatt hours at three to four cents out of a coal plant. And um, that's because they're not paying for the pollution that they're dumping into the air. And they're not paying for you know, the horrible things they do to mountaintops in, in Appalachia. Um, so you're getting all this cheap energy um, so that that other, you know, and other people are having to suffer. I mean, literally, if you look at the World Health Organization website, the, uh, they've done studies on coal pollution, and it literally kills thousands of Americans every year, every year. That pollution is pretty horrendous. And I don't know if you saw in the LA Times a couple of weeks ago a little story about domestic fish, dangerous to eat because of mercury. That mercury comes from coal plants. So we've got to shut those down. Uh, but you're, you know, you're getting this cheap electricity in DWP territory, and they've had cheap electric rates compared to Edison for a long, long time. And that's because they're so heavily dependent on coal. So you're polluting other people's air and water, uh, so you can have cheap electricity. Now, I'm a solar uh, consultant, so I go in people's homes and I, I bid solar systems. When I'm in DWP territory, I see people wasting electricity like you wouldn't believe. And it's because it's cheap. It's so cheap, they waste it. You go into Edison territory, they have tiered rates. So you get a certain number of kilowatt hours for 12 cents, then the next tier is 14, then it goes up to uh, 24 cents, 28 cents, 31 cents. So the more you use, the more it costs. And this is a great incentive to cut down on your use so that you stay in the lower tiers. In DWP, they had a flat rate, 11 and a half cents, for years and years and years. And so people would just waste it incredibly. I use about 600, 700 kilowatt hours a month with the electric car in the house. And I go into houses that are using eight, 10,000. It's like a grocery store. You know, they've got swimming pools, they've got multiple refrigerators, they've got all the lights on, big flat screen plasma, not LCD, because plasma uses more energy. And um, they do whatever they can to use energy. And, and they just throw it away because it's cheap. Well, DWP just changed on July 1 to three tiers. So now they've got tiered rates, 12 cents, 14 cents, 16 cents. Not nearly as much as Edison, but they're trying. And once you've instituted tiered rates, it's great, because then you leave tier, tier one alone. And tier one is um, 500 kilowatt hours a month. So if you use under 500 kilowatt hours a month, you're only paying 12 cents. Uh, but when you get up into higher tiers, now if you wanted to raise rates, you just raise tier three. Just jack it up, jack it up, keep going. And so you're only going to be affecting the rich people and the people who waste a lot. And those are the people who should be paying. Because you got to, you know, I'm serious. I mean, they're not paying, right now, they're not paying the full cost. 
because not a dime that you pay, none of your money goes to mitigate the health costs that you're, you're causing by using electricity from dirty sources. None of it. So you've got to start jacking up these prices to get off of coal. And the only way to do that, the, the fair way, is to put all the price increases in the top tiers. And that way you have a choice. You can still you know, burn that, uh, that plasma screen all day long, uh, but you know, you're at least paying more of the cost of it and not putting the cost on the people who have to breathe the pollution. So, but let's get back to electric cars because the, um, there's, there's a lot of choices. Now, any of you drive motorcycles? A couple of you, good. I have this thing called the Vectrix, and I want you to look it up. It is a very cool, it's a scooter, but it holds two people and it goes 62 miles an hour, and it goes zero to 60 in about eight seconds. It's fast. Um, and this thing's been around for a couple of years now. They cost about eh, a little over 7,000. So it's a little expensive compared to a gasoline one, but it is the, the ideal commuter vehicle for LA if you are willing to drive a motorcycle because you, know, you can get anywhere on it. It's very quick. It has this regen uh, so that you, know, you, you accelerate like this, but when you want to stop, you just reverse the throttle and, and it's perfectly linear. And it, the more you do it, the harder you stop, and it's all regenerative braking. It's got Brembo brakes if you need an emergency stop, but I rarely use them. It's pretty much all drive with one hand. And so electric motorcycles are coming on big time. There's a company in uh, the Bay Area called Mission Motors, and they, they make a motorcycle that goes 150 miles an hour. It's got a 150-mile range, and 0 to 60 in about 2.9. And uh, they, they say they're going to let me test drive it in, in a little while, so I'm, I'm almost scared to, but I'm definitely going to try that one out. Um, what other kind of cars are coming? Well, uh, Tesla Motors has their car on the road. Have any of you ridden in a Tesla yet? Was it fun? <laughs> it was so cool. Did you, did you come out giggling? I mean, it's, it's like these cars go 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. Um, when I was a kid, uh, in Alabama, we, slot cars first came out, and this is in the mid-60s, and you could get this little car, had a little electric motor in it, and you'd go pay a penny a minute for time on the track, and you had this plunger, and you'd zip it, and the car would go, boom! It would just take off. There's so much torque. And that's what this car is. This car goes like a slot car. And you can go from here to that wall, and you'll be going 50 miles an hour by the time you get to that wall. It is that fast, and, and it'll continue that acceleration all the way up to 125. Now, these cars are on the road today. You can see them. They're uh, right over here. You're really close to them uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard. That's their first store ever, and they've got about eight stores around the world right now. And uh, the, these cars are, they, they are proving that electric cars are viable. Um, the guy who started the company, Elon Musk, uh, he wrote PayPal, by the way and sold PayPal to eBay for about a billion dollars. He was 34 years old. And he started three companies. He started um, uh, uh, Space Explorations, which is a rocket ship company. They just landed a $1.5 billion contract with NASA to replace the shuttle. Then he started Tesla Motors and Solar City, the company that I work for. And Tesla Motors was, you know, he could have started out making a small economy car for 30,000. But he said, no, I'm going to prove that electric cars are viable. I'm going to go after the Ferrari market. So he built the Tesla. And this car beats every Ferrari. It beats um, uh, every Lamborghini, Porsche, I mean, everything. It's, it's the fastest production car in the world. The quickest, I should say. It doesn't have the top speed of those cars. Yes? Well, the, the, well they, they all have to do with uh, climate change and, and essentially putting a, a price on carbon. And it is vitally important that it pass. Uh, we lost the battle to get a carbon tax a long time ago. Nobody would even take it and run with it. But that's the easy way. That's the smart way. And unfortunately, we have very little leadership in, in uh, the federal and state level. Nobody wanted to take a carbon tax on. Uh, so, so the next best thing is cap and trade. And that's what this bill does. Um, it essentially puts a cap on the amount of CO2 that is being emitted by the country and so that if you emit CO2, if you're a coal plant, then uh, you'll continue emitting the, that, but you have to buy 
uh, credits in order to do that. So essentially what it does is it raises the price of dirty energy, which is the bottom line. That's what we have to do. Uh, so anything that you can do to get that law passed, you know, definitely support our senators because Boxer is one of the supporters. It's now the Boxer carry uh, bill in the Senate, and they're just now starting to do hearings on it. Um, it's got a re if you thought the Republicans were fighting health care, wait till you see what they do with energy. And, and so it's going to be horribly hard to get passed, but we have to get it passed because once you've put a price on carbon, now the dirty fuels cost a little more. It's a tiny bit. I mean, they're screaming bloody murder, and it's only going to raise the price a tiny bit, but it's a start. And then we need to continue adding the costs into the price of dirty fuels so that the clean fuels can compete on an even playing field. And that's what we haven't had for a long, long time. That's why we have to support or subsidize solar and wind because, you know, oil industry, we pay the oil industry tens of billions of dollars in subsidies every year. And, and they take that money and, and then they make tens of billions of dollars in profit. So uh, it, it's been bad all along, but now we've at least got Obama in. We have a chance of getting some good legislation. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Copenhagen's not going to be as, as good as what we want, uh, but it's just because the fight is that hard. Yes? Um, what percentage of your house and car run off of your solar panels? 100 per well, my electric bill is about $100 a year. So uh, I, and, and it used to be zero. It used to be negative uh, for a couple of years. But what I did is I got rid of the uh, gas water heater that I had and put a solar water heater with an electric backup. So in the winter, like we're getting into the short days now, I don't generate as much hot water from the sun. So I use a little bit of electricity. And that, and I got the electric motorcycle. So I use a bit more. But generally, it's about $100 a year. And, that's, and, and I haven't been to a gas station since 2002. And I've driven 76,000 miles. So that's your future.